Good evening, visitors. Welcome to the Australian War Memorial's last post ceremony. My name is Nathan Boyd, and joining us today from the Australian Army is Captain Mitchell McDermott. We welcome the veterans who have served, those who are still serving, and the families that love and support them. We acknowledge the members of RSL and Services Club Association, RSL Victoria, and RSL Queensland, who are watching the broadcast of this ceremony across Australia. During this evening's ceremony, wreaths will be laid at the base of the pool of reflection by visitors to the memorial. If you are able, please stand and join in singing the national anthem. The Australian War Memorial was a vision of Charles Bean, Australia's First World War official historian. Bean landed with the Australian troops on Gallipoli and stayed with them at the front through to the end of the war. The idea of this national memorial and museum came to him at Pozier, France, in the depths of the bloody fighting of 1916. Bean's idea was that this would be a place where family and friends could mourn loved ones buried in faraway places. It would also be a place that could help all Australians understand what these men and women had endured and what they had done for us. Bean's vision, to which we remain true, is best expressed as, in as inscribed in the entrance to the memorial's galleries. Here is their spirit in the heart of the land they loved, and here we guard the record which they themselves made. Tonight, we will read the story behind just one of those on the Roll of Honour, which lists the names of more than 102,000 men and women who gave their lives for us in war and an operation for more than a century. But first, we present a lament. Flowers of the forest. Wreaths of floral tributes will now be laid at the base of the pool of reflection. Today, we remember and pay tribute to Private James Francis Kemp. James Kemp, known as Jim, was born in 1874, the second eldest son of John and Kate, 
camp of Belfast, Victoria. Little is known of his early life. He probably grew up in Port Ferry and at, la at least part of his education was conducted at the local Port Ferry School. At some point, he became a barman and worked for the commercial hotel in Port Ferry. He was described as a sport willing to oblige whenever the occasion required his services and his general manner endeared him to everybody. He was a general favourite and could not have had a single enemy. Jim Kemp enlisted in the Australian Imperial Force in July 1915. He travelled to Bendigo to do so and put his age down by three years, from 41 to 38, in order to make sure he was accepted. Allotted to reinforcements for the 5th Battalion, Kemp underwent a period of training in Australia before leaving for active service overseas on the 23rd of November 1915. Private Jim Kemp was first sent to Egypt. He wrote to his brother Malloy to say, reached here about a fortnight ago after a very pleasant but uneventful voyage. The journey through the Suez Canal is a lovely one and most of the sights I saw will never be forgotten by me. Little did I, as well as many others think that it would be my good fortune to sail up it. Kemp had been in Egypt a month before he fell ill with a severe fever and heart condition. After weeks of treatment, he was sent to the hospital in England. He wrote to Malloy that the doctor had first thought he'd had typhoid fever. In his typical breezy manner, Jim wrote, in the finish he said that I have some, in some way slightly strained the heart and that a spell of a few weeks would do me no harm. So he shipped me off to England and I had a splendid trip across. His letters were described as being written in a cheerful, hopeful strain with pleasing references about and kindly remembrances to all his old mates in Port Ferry and District. It took Private Kemp many months to recover enough to return to his battalion, but he was able to do so in October 1916 as the bitterly cold winter of 1916 and 17 began. In March the following year, he wrote, have had a fairly rough time of it for the last few months. Cold is no name for it. It is nothing but snow and ice. And when the snow melts, you are up to your knees in mud. It is not unusual to be wet through a week at a time. And the wonder is that there is not more sickness. Although Kemp had managed to avoid major operations, he faced danger from the front line. He described how he had several narrow escapes, writing, Coming out of the front line some time back, I saw a poor lad killed alongside of me. He was hit on the head and died a few minutes afterwards. A day or so later, one of the huts was blown to pieces. The result was four were killed and five were wounded. As luck would have it, I was not inside at the time, but I was just standing at the door, so I escaped with a bit of a shock. A lot of the other boys were in the hut. They made a miraculous escape some being blown clean through the top, and they never had it even a scratch. So it just shows you the luck of the game. By the end of winter, Private Kemp's health could take no more, and he was once again evacuated to hospital in England with sickness. In, 19, uh, correction, in September 1917, he wrote to his mother to say, I have been very lucky since I left Australia in getting away when there was nothing on a large scale and it remains to be seen if my good luck will stick to me. Private James Kemp never posted that letter. Instead, it was taken from his body after he'd been killed at the Battle of Menon Road, 10 days after he'd written it. A friend posted it on his behalf. James Kemp's platoon commander later wrote to Miss Kemp reporting, we were improving our new position when a shrapnel shell burst very close to him. Death must have been instantaneous. He looked pleasant and suffered no pain. I looked on Jim as one of my best men and several times offered him a promotion, but he always refused. He was very popular with the boys and well liked through the company. I hope when my time comes, I shall meet it nobly and doing my bit as well as your son James. Private Jim Kemp was buried close to where he was killed, but his grave was lost during the fighting. Today he is commemorated on the Menin Gate Memorial along with nearly 55,000 others with no grave. He was 43 years old. 
His name is listed on the Roll of Honour on my right amongst almost 62,000 Australians who died while serving in the First World War. A photograph of his name listed on the Menengate Memorial is displayed today beside the Pool of Reflection. This is but one of the many stories of service and sacrifice told here at the Australian War Memorial. We now remember Private James Francis Kemp, who gave his life for us, for our freedoms, and in the hope of a better world. Please stand for the reading of the ode and the sounding of the last post. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. Lest we forget. Lest we forget. We leave you this evening with the words of the memorial's founder, Charles Bean. Many a man lying out there at Poziers or in the low scrub of Gallipoli with his poor, tired senses barely working through the fever of his brain has thought in his last moments, well, well, it's over. But in Australia, they will be proud of this. Ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, that concludes the last post ceremony. On behalf of the director and staff, thank you for visiting the Australian War Memorial today and your continued support for the Memorial's development project. We particularly appreciate your visit despite the challenges posed by COVID and wish you all a very pleasant evening. <laughs>